Now we'll consider formula for the area of a surface of revolution. So I have my curve F. We're going to go from A to B along the x-axis. What we're doing is we're taking the graph of F over A and B. We're going to take it. We're going to revolve around the x-axis. That's going to sweep out an area. And then we're going to have a formula for how to compute that area. So our formula is going to be A equals 2 pi definite integral from A to B of f of x radical 1 plus f prime squared dx. The only case I'm going to consider is where our function is completely above the x-axis, so f is positive. And I'm also going to only consider rotating around the x-axis. We could consider other axes of revolution, but we'll just stick with the x-axis for now. All right. Before we get to examples, let's try to derive this just to get an idea of what's going on here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use tangent lines to approximate the area by way of frustrums. This is going to look a lot like our derivation for arc length. What we're going to do is I'm going to take my interval from A to B, we're going to chop it up into a lot of tiny subintervals over each subinterval, we're going to be able to pull out a slice, which I can approximate with a frustrum. So what's a frustrum? A frustrum is just going to be a right circular cone, and I chop off the end of it at a right angle. Or you can think of it as, I'm going to take a right circular cone, subtract off a right circular cone from the front. What do I need to get the area? I'll have to measure the line across the top. I'll need both radii, R1 and R2, line across the top is L, then my formula is 2 pi L, and then the average of the radii, or R1 plus R2 over 2. The 2's go together to give me pi L, R1 plus R2. Now, what do we want to do? Well, if I'm going to take my surface of revolution and chop it up into a lot of little ones, so we'll just take some little subinterval, pull that out, this is going to be it blown up. What I'm going to do is, well, this thing is not going to be a frustrum, but if I use the tangent line, I'll have something that's close enough to a frustrum where I can approximate the area of this little mini surface of revolution with a frustrum. And then when I take the limit, all the differences are going to crush down to zero, and hopefully with the limiting process, we're going to get our area. So that's what we're aiming for now. So let's try to get a handle on the frustrum. So what do we need? According to my formula, I'm going to need the L across the top, and then R1 and R2. R1 and R2 are going to be easy. R1, the small one, by the way I've drawn it, is just going to be f of x0. That's going to be the point on the curve above x0. OK, I'm choosing another point, x1, just so I have something for reference. What else do we need? Well, if I choose x0 and x1, I get the base of this right triangle, which is going to give me delta x. Okay, We want to get this right triangle here, because if I can get the base and the height, I can use the Pythagorean theorem to get this L here. And then that L is going to let me compute the area of the frustrum generated by revolving this around the axis. So now what do I need? We have the base. I need to get the whole get the height, and I also need the second radius. So I'm going to bring in the tangent line to get a handle on all of that. What's the equation of the tangent line? y minus y0 equals m x minus x0. x0, y0 is a point on our curve. So that's going to be x0, f of x. So my y0 is going to be f of x0. Over here, we'll have the x0 in this slot. Our slope is just going to be the derivative of f at x0. Now here's the equation for the tangent line. What's going on here? Well, if I want to note the height of this right triangle is, note the top point is just going to be the point on the tangent line at x1, y of x1. The bottom is just going to be f of x0. So if I take their difference, that's the same as putting x1 into the equation for the tangent line. That's going to give me y of x1 minus f of x0. 
but that's going to be equal to f prime of x0 times x1 minus x0, and that's just going to give me the base. So delta x is equal to x1 minus x0. So I have the base, and I have the height of my right triangle, which means Pythagorean theorem is going to give me L. So let's stick things into our equation. So we have pi L R1 plus R2. And remember, R2 is now Y of X1. That's just going to be the point that hits the tangent line above X1 or Y of X1. OK, so R1 plus R2 is going to be F of X0 plus Y of X1. L is just going to be given by using the Pythagorean theorem. The base is delta x squared. The height is f prime x0 times delta x quantity squared. We have a pi out in front. Now, inside this radical, I can factor out a delta x squared. To bring it out of the radical, it's just going to lose its square and just become delta x. What's left is 1 plus f prime x0 squared. Now, one other thing to note. As I let the base get smaller and smaller, as x1 gets closer to x0, we note that my y of x1 is going to get closer and closer to f of x0. So if we're just approximating, I can just call y of x1 f of x0. Now I'm getting close to an actual formula. So let's see what's going on with the limiting process. In the big picture, what are we doing? I'm taking my interval. We're chopping it up into much smaller subintervals, and then what we're going to do is pull a slice out and approximate it with the frustrum by using the tangent line. So what we have is, for each frustrum, I'm going to get an Li that's going to give me an Ai. So for the ith frustrum, we're associating an ith area. The area of the whole thing will be approximated by taking the summation over each area for each eye. So that's this thing here. As I let the base length go down to zero, that's going to give me the definition of the definite integral of our area functions. So let's take a look at what happens with that. OK, so I have this thing here. We're going to take the summation over all of our frustrums. So what's going to happen? Well, in the limiting process, the delta x is going to turn into dx. And since I'm taking a sum, this sum here turns into our definite integral from a to b. Now we just got to clean up what's left over. OK, the pi we just pick up. The radical 1 plus f prime of x0 squared. Well, the x0 is really now an xi. It's going to be going over a whole bunch of points, the endpoints of all the intervals we're using. but when we pass to the integral, we just take each particular point and replace it with x. So I have radical 1 plus f prime x, quantity squared. What's left over? I have my f of x0, which will go to, as I noted here, it's just going to go to f of x. All the particular points just become the generic x. And then here we noted y of x1 is pretty close to f of x0, so that's just going to go to f of x also. So I'll have a 2 f of x and then a dx. What happens? The 2 pi can come out in front. And then what's left over is what we have in our formula for the area of a surface of revolution right here. So now let's take a look at ex some examples. Now that I have the area function, let's apply it to three cases. For my first case, consider the cylinder, radius r, and height h. In this case, f of x is going to be equal to r, the radius. This is a constant, so its derivative is going to be equal to 0. So when I put things into the area formula, this gadget here is just going to collapse to a 1, because it's 1 plus the derivative squared. Derivative is 0. Radical of 1 is 1. The f of x that goes here is just going to be an r. And we notice everything here is constant, so it just pulls out. So I have 2 pi r. And then we're looking at the integral from 0 to h of dx. Integral of dx is just x. So we put in h and 0 and take their difference. That gives me capital H. And we know that this agrees with our formula for the surface area of the cylinder, not counting the tops. 
For my second case, we consider the right circular cone. Again, I'm going to put it on its side. This is going to have base radius r, height h. So h is going to be our range of integration as we let it range over x. And then we need to figure out what this top function is. So note that it's a straight line through the origin. So all I need is the slope. Slope is rise over run. It's rise is capital R. It's run is h. So our function is going to be r over h times x. Its derivative is r over h. So when I put into the area formula, I'm looking at radical 1 plus f prime squared, which is r squared over h squared, times f of x, which is rx over h, times 2 pi. And then we integrate from 0 to h. Now note, r over h is a constant. Radical 1 plus r squared over h squared is a constant. We pull them out, and I'm just left integrating from 0 to h of x dx. Any derivative of x is 1 half x squared, and then we're going to put in h and 0. So that's just going to give me 1 half h squared. The 1 half is going to cancel with the, the 2 in front of the pi. My h squared, I'm going to be able to take away the h in the bottom if I give up one of these. And then the h that remains, I shove to the inside of the radical as an h squared. So we get h squared plus r squared under the radical. Or, in summary, my area of the cone is going to be pi r radical r squared plus h squared. And note, this does not count the top piece. For our last example, let's consider the sphere of radius r. So we'll start with the upper semicircle of the circle of radius r at the origin. We have x squared plus y squared equals r squared. I push the x squared to the other side. I square root. And since I'm only considering y bigger than 0, I only use the positive solution. We're going to rotate around the x-axis. So let's take a look at the formula. I look for f prime. Well, that's going to be r squared minus x squared to the 1 half. We bring the half down, subtract 1. Derivative of the inside is minus 2x. We square that. These 2's go away, so the only thing that shows up on top is going to be x squared. And then in the bottom, I have the square of this, which is r squared minus x squared. I want to add 1 to this, but to do it in a way that's useful, I'm going to do it as r squared minus x squared over r squared minus x squared. When I combine it with this term, we're going to get an r squared over r squared minus x squared. Finally, we square root, which gives r over radical r squared minus x squared. We go to our area formula. Okay, area, not length. So we know this is the, the radical gadget that we have to pick up. This is the function itself. We have our 2 pi, and we're going to integrate from minus r to r. So these cancel out. The r pulls out to the front. So I'm left integrating from minus r to r of dx. The antiderivative is going to be x. And then I'm going to evaluate r and minus r and take the difference. So that's r minus a minus r, or r plus r, which is 2r, which gives me 4 pi r squared, which we know is the surface area of a sphere of radius r.